great testimonies tonight and, and uh, also very prompt. I really appreciate that. Everybody who had their, we went mic to mic to mic. I think that was, that was awesome. Thank you. So uh, just one test, one prayer request I'd like to give you if you can pray for our family. Uh, Mac left yesterday morning on his way to New York City and uh, is planning on, uh, Lord willing, making that home. All right. So that's his plan. He's up there. He's got through several interviews this week uh, for a job position, looking for a vocal coach and and uh, for opportunities there to continue to develop vocally and uh, be able to sing professionally. So uh, you can pray pray for him and also pray for us. Our, our nest is emptying uh, kind of in rapid fashion. We're down to my daughter at home. Yes, she does not like being the only child at home. Too much attention. So <laughs> anyway, so uh, and then uh, we had uh, our, ourselves and the Slatteries went over to the, uh, to the um, uh, class or the orientation for foster care. If you're interested in, in, in uh, going through the class, there is a class, of parent, it's called professional parenting. Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that like to improve your parenting skills, but <laughs> if you want to get certified to be able to be involved in foster care or uh, in uh, adoption through the foster system, uh, they even have introduced a new thing, which you don't have to go through all of that, but they do have a, a new program called Safe Homes. And it, the idea there uh, is in a time of crisis, uh, sometimes a family who may be losing a house and may be facing the possibility of homelessness and other things, they look for homes that would open up and take children on a temporary basis in a time of crisis and uh, be a safe home. And so they certify your home. Uh, you don't have to go through all the foster care, but there, I mean, there is background check. There's some stuff that you do have to go through, uh, but you don't have to, to have all the same things and then there's obviously we've got folks involved in mentoring and I'm thankful for each one of our mentors and the opportunities they've had to impact their ment uh, their families that they they're involved in and uh, so as you remember that whole program remember our folks that are involved in our church and mentoring also uh, Rhonda and I are considering whether it's something the Lord would have us to do in that whole arena of uh, foster care and I uh, just want to impact children in our community and uh, so if the Lord's empty in our home we may fill it back up just differently all right so all right, uh, I feel like I should probably just step down and turn the pulpit over to Dr. Compton since we are in the book of Isaiah, and I hijacked his notes for this. Uh, I asked, <laughs> so uh, I, I asked for him to, to, to pass along some notes, and I've been following his outline and been enjoying studying through the book of Isaiah. Uh, we've been some time since we've looked there. Uh, so I'd ask you to open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 4. Um, along the social media line, uh, but uh, one I would pass along. Uh, you can subscribe to this. Uh, Dr. Kevin Bowder puts out a, an article called The Nick of Time. Um, and anyway, I thought it was interesting. This last one, he, and you'll like this for all, uh, for all you folks who've escaped your cold winter, he was sharing about the Minnesota winter and how for 16 years he uh, has, has always sought to dodge the winter by being from heat to heat and, and really you know, looked out at the people who went all the different sports that take place when it's sub-zero. He thought those people were rather foolish. So this year he made a new pack that he was going to get outside in the winter, walk in it, and, and figure out what all those people were doing, if they were really truly nuts, or if he was missing something. Uh, so anyway, he's been walking, but it, he makes the, the point, the final point, you could read it, go to it, but makes the point that, that really winter didn't change, but as a result of going out, learning how to dress in it, and going out and enjoying what ac the activities that you really can enjoy in the midst of winter, he learned not to dread it. And it wasn't the circumstances that changed, it was his perspective that changed. And then he made that connection to so many things in our Christian life is like that. We often want the circumstances to change, but so often what really needs to change is our perspective. And uh, we talked a little bit about that this morning as far as keeping our eye on the prize. And the Lord would have it that we would uh, be in Isaiah chapter 4 because it pushes you right back to what we talked about this morning. That there is a, a right perspective that the Christian life is lived with. Uh, and if you're here tonight as not a child of God, then it's not even possible for you to live with this perspective. But for the children of God, there is great news. There is great perspective because our God has won the victory. And his son is coming to rule and to reign in righteousness and and so in, in Isaiah chapter 4, uh, Isaiah having laid out uh, the, the, the judgment of God, and again, uh, Israel is living in, 
and covenant disobedience and, and unbelief. And God sends his prophets to confront the nation again and again and sets forward the, the days of coming judgment. In fact, the last time we were here at the end of chapter 3, he specifically focuses the judgment on the, the women, the leading women of the nation and the result of the destitute misery that's going to happen as, as God takes them into captivity. Uh, similar to what we talked about in Haggai as the people were disobedient and uh, looking at and, and the real question even as God began to restore the temple worship is, well, what about the kingdom? Well, as Israel is, is receiving the prophecy of God, of the doom and the, the coming judgment of God into captivity, that they would go into captivity, uh, and all that would happen, they, again, their question is going to run right back, well, yeah, but God, you promised us king. You promised a Davidic king, and you promised one who would reign and bring about a, a reign of righteousness. Well, what about that? And so the, the prophets you'll find oftentimes, uh, the prophets will go from a declaration or an oracle of judgment. God has given a message of coming judgment to the nation and calling on them to repent. And then right behind that will come a declaration of coming restoration, of grace, of what God's going to do, but after the judgment. And then again, pushing their vision forward uh, to that God is going to be faithful to his promises. The, 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 the nation, the, the, those that have been unfaithful are going to face the judgment of God, uh, but God is going to be faithful to his promises and fulfill all that he's promised to do. So in Isaiah, we've, I should have already come through this, this is just where we've walked and in, in where we're at, the prophecies concerning Judah and Jerusalem and, and the judgment that's coming and then uh, prior to millennial deliverance. And so last section we're at, chapter 3, 16 to 4, and then chapter 4, is the prophecy concerning uh, deliverance and restoration. Uh, deliverance and restoration. So I'd like to read that text. Isaiah 4, beginning verse 2. In that day the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious and the fruit of the land and shall be the, the pride and the honor. I'm sorry, did I put? Yes, all right, sorry. Let me move that up. All right. And, and shall be the pride and the honor of the survivors of Israel. And he who is left in Zion remains in Jerusalem. He will be called holy, everyone who has been recorded for life in Jerusalem. And when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and cleansed the bloodstains of Jerusalem from its midst, a spirit of judgment, by a spirit of judgment and by a spirit of burning, then the Lord will create over the whole site of Mount Zion and over assemblies a cloud by day and a smoke uh, and, and smoke and the shining of a flame by, flaming fire by night. Over all the glory there will be a canopy. There will be a booth for shade by day and from the heat and for a refuge and a shelter from the storm and rain. And so in that day, again, reference we see oftentimes in the prophets and uh, understanding again a reference to a coming day, a day of the Lord, a day which will involve both judgment but also deliverance. Um, both aspects are included in that day of the Lord, a coming day of judgment where God is going to judge unbelief and ultimately bring it to destruction, so false hopes, uh, pretense of, uh, of those who have a pretense relationship with God are going to be fully exposed and be disappointed because judgment will come. Uh, complacency will be eliminated, and there, then there will be a cleansing and a restoration for the people of God. And, and you can see references to it here, uh, that the, the people will be cleansed, and then they will be called holy. Uh, the filth will be washed away, the cleansing of their blood, uh, the blood stains, and through uh, judgment, and, and through the, this coming time of judgment, that it, which also involves a time of restoration. Uh, so this is uh, that ongoing tension or that ongoing uh, dynamic we see throughout the prophets and especially throughout, well, really all of the, the prophets, both major and minor prophets, will see this kind of tension uh, as we work through it. And so this section then points to a restoration that will take place in the coming time of a, a millennial kingdom when the king will come, when the messianic promised one will come, and he used that language of the branch of the Lord, uh, language used in, in Jeremiah and Zechariah, uh, later used, later in, the, in, in Isaiah, we'll use it again in chapter 11 and chapter 53, uh, both speaking forward to a future son, to this one. In fact, he, he compares the nation will be brought in judgment to really a, a smol like a smoldering stump. As a result of God's judgment, the nation is reduced to like a smoldering stump. From that smoldering ash of a nation will come a sprout or a branch, which will be then that very promised Messiah will become that God will be faithful 
to his promises, uh, even though people have not been faithful to God. God is going to be faithful. He's going to raise up the Messiah. And following these, the, the judgments of God and the day of the Lord will come, this, become the Messiah who will return, who will ultimately reign in Jerusalem and Judea. And the, those who remain, those who are uh, really who look on the Lord, Isaiah 53, as those who will look on the Lord whom they pierced, uh, those who will then be restored, those who will believe when the Lord returns, as we read the text in Zechariah this morning, returns the Mount of Olives, splits in half. And so all, you know, Paul will say in Romans, and so all Israel will be saved. The, you know, the, there's a remnant of Israel that are going to look to the Messiah at the return and trust Christ. And Christ is going to return, and they are going to be wholly set apart unto the Lord. And so he's pointing forward to what's going to take place after the tribulation judgments. And through the tribulation judgments, God is going to cleanse Israel. Uh, in fact, in each aspect of, of God's time of judging the nation, it was all part of cleansing them of sin, cleansing them of idolatry. I mean, you think about it, when they went into captivity, the nation was just rank with idolatry. I mean, they were going to every hill, and they were sacrificing to Chemosh and Amalek and the Asherah pole, and, and, and through captivity and coming out of captivity, Israel never returned again to that kind of idolatry. Different kind of idolatry, but not that kind. They never again began to worship Asherah and all of that. They they really did focus on, on worshiping Yahweh. And uh, in fact, even in Israel, you know, a Jew today is not going to be involved in all that kind of all idolatry. So in one sense, I mean, through the, the captivity time, God purged Israel of that kind of idolatry. And God is still in the process of purging her, Israel, of the idolatry in the, in the fact they've forsaken their Lord, the promised Messiah. They've not believed the promise of God. And in, in really, through God's chastening, if you look at what the author of Hebrews tells us, when we begin to be entertained by sin, and we begin to pursue sin, God must chasten. And that chastening is to the orientation to produce about what? A peaceable fruit of righteousness. It's that transformation of life. And so God's chastening hand is a purifying effect. And God will purify the nation of Israel ultimately through the tribulation judgments. Israel will be purified. They will look on Christ. They will then be set apart as holy unto the Lord. And, and so he, Isaiah, as he's, he's prophesied, set forth this coming day of judgment, he turns from that, and God gives him this oracle of the coming deliverance connected to God's fulfillment of his promises in connection with sending forth the Messiah. And so... The Lord will, even as he says in this, will establish uh, over Israel a cloud by day, a pillar of a cloud by day, and a pillar of fire by night, and mark his presence. He will ultimately be a shelter for his people and a refuge, uh, and in indicating again that those who know the Lord have nothing to fear. I mean, there's nothing in all of creation that's greater than God. The God who created creation is the source of our refuge, is the is our shield. And he points Israel to this reality that this coming day from the Lord, it is coming, it is certain, it is absolute. And folks, you know, we're not Israel, but the pro and, and the promise of the coming Lord applies a little bit differently to us than it does to Israel because we each have distinct roles in the coming eternal kingdom. But what the point that is he's driving home to the nation is God is purifying you in preparation of a certain future. And this is what you are to live in light of and for. And, and we find that same function, we find that same kind of call throughout our New Testament, that this is, this is a certainty. Folks, you know, I, I don't know, sometimes I, I, I meant this comment a few weeks ago, and some of you looked at me a little strange. Did you know that Easter is not a Christian holiday? In fact, its roots is actually very pagan. And it simply got an, incorporated into the church and made a special occasion. Now, I'm not saying all that to say don't celebrate Easter. Although some of you do better to get rid of your bunnies and eggs, but anyway, that's not the point. <laughs> you know, but when, when, is, when, when, when do we celebrate Easter? Every Sunday. It's resurrection Sunday. That's why we meet. We meet on Sunday because it's the res it, is a, it, a, it is a reminder that our Lord rose over victory, over sin and death. And he is coming again. That he has paved the way for us to enter into God's presence, to enjoy fellowship with God now and forever. 
And, and we're, we're called on to live in that reality of what is certain, uh, to live every day with that truth in front of us. The Lord is coming, isn't he? And, and, you know, it's not good news when you have a lot of other treasures in front of you that you can't wait to accomplish. When you're thinking, man, I've got, you know, this thing, I'm looking forward to that, I'm looking forward to that, and, and this one, and that one, and, and oh yeah, the Lord may come, and and folks, you know, when the, and I know, and I, you know, so we, we all do this, and, and I, I'm, I'm good with it in one sense, but it's sad that, you know, as our society tends to get more and more debauched, we all think, man, I can't wait for the Lord to come. Uh, but the reality is, is that should be how I live, whether it's a good day in my society or a bad one. There is no good day that I've ever enjoyed on this, on this earth that will ever compare to what I will enjoy in the presence of the Lord forever. And part of my unbelief is I don't live in anticipation of that. Part of the unbelief that's still in my heart is I've only tasted to point the Lord is good, but the full experience of the Lord's goodness is something that's in front of me. But the taste should be such that it creates that anticipation of what is so much more. And, and nothing in this world can compare to it. And so as Isaiah uh, really sets forth to the nation of Israel, he sets forth that then there's judgment coming. Behind that judgment, you know, your unfaithfulness is not going to make God unfaithful. God is going to fulfill his promises to the nation. And, and you have to remember this, too. Within Israel, not all of them were, were rank, hard, hard-necked unbelievers. A lot of them were, okay, right? That's why they went into captivity. But not everybody that went into captivity were unbelievers. The believing Israelites were swept up in that as well right? Because they were all part of that nation. Okay? And what were they to hold on to? Because the kingdom just got swept out, all the temporal blessings that God had promised to them in relation to the covenant are gone. So what are they to hold on to? Well, the reality is God, God hasn't forsaken his promises. As they continue to trust the Lord and obey, God has a future for them that's absolutely certain, even in the midst of present difficulties. And so they were to hold on to these promises and they were to be very dear to them. And they should be very dear to us. Yeah, I don't know whether America's going to last another 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, 100 years. I don't know. Of course it's going. I wouldn't say so. But that's up to the Lord, isn't it? But the worst thing that would happen wouldn't be the end of America. Even if it happens in my lifetime, this is the worst thing that would happen. Why? Because my hope is not built on the continuation of this nation, whether economically or any other way. My hope is rooted in a f future that's absolutely certain because it's a future that God has promised and has already provided for. And so my hopes are not rooted in the temporal. Now, I'm not rooting for America to be destroyed. Don't get me wrong. I actually am praying all the more that God would be pleased to send a wave of revival that would begin here and sweep here and then go out into our country. That we get tired of the fake Christianity that's been so dominant in our culture for so long. Uh, and, and really have a genuine love and worship of God that would produce a transformed people that would engage a culture with the gospel like we're called to do. Uh, so much of Christianity has been about pursuing the American dream and somehow making it Christian. It really has. So much of American Christianity and so much of what's out there is, quote, worshiping God is no more than worshiping ourselves, bandaged up in some look about calling Christ the provider of all of our financial and physical prosperity. You know, so if we can worship God and he gives us all that we want here, that's a great, great worship. Well, it's, it's fraudulent. It's empty. And, and so much of American Christianity looks like that, tastes like that, smells like that, and it's just absolutely abominable. Um, so, anyway, that's not kind of a side note, sorry. But uh, last thing, I, just, I do want to read Isaiah, the, the parable of the vineyard. Because it's such a moving parable here as the Lord makes this comparative and he's got such a convicting statement in here uh, that I think all of us as we walk away tonight ought to let this one ring in our hearts and our minds. Uh, now he's talking to Israel, okay, but y you get the point. Uh, I think when we read this, we'll get the, very, the point, especially when he asks the question, what more was there to do? Um, but let me read the text and uh, then I'll make a connecting point uh, for us. But Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1 through 7. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved hath a vineyard and on a very fertile hill. He dug it, he cleared it, uh, he cleared it of stones, and he planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it, and he hewed out uh, a wine vat in it. And he looked 
for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. Now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem, men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there for me to what more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, did it yield why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I'll remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its walls, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It will sh shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they, that they rain, no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. He looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. For righteousness, but behold, an outcry. And... Here he brings this parable to, to really reflect and set forth his, his special love and care that God has lavished upon Israel as his covenant nation. He set them apart of all the people of the world. He set them in a plush land, a land of plenty. And, and, and he has put a hedge of protection about them. He's done all of this. And yet he looked for his vineyard to bear fruit, spiritual fruit. The fruits of righteousness, fruits of justice, the fruits that look like uh, we come New Testament wise, it would look like the fruit of the Spirit. It would look like those who genuinely, who genuinely love God, love the things of God. They love what God loves. God is a God of justice. God is a God of righteousness. Uh, that's what God looked for to come from His people, to come from the nation that He planted for His glory. Right? It's His vineyard, planted for His glory, cared for, loved, nourished. Yet, what did it produce? It produced worthlessness. Now, folks, it didn't become irreligious. But just remember, the religion of Israel was absolutely empty. It was worthless. You know, sometimes I, I think we, you know, because we, we talked about this even in Sunday school and, and even as connecting to Steve's point, uh, you know, in his testimony tonight. You know, I can stand up here and tell you, you know, there's a lot of churches today that just went through empty ritual and start naming, you know, they, they have their book, they read their readings, responsive readings, do this, do that, bow then, step here, do these things, and it's a ritual, a very rote ritual done over and over, and that's really, Israel had turned their whole worship system into a, a ritual, a dead ritual of nothing more than coming and presenting offerings with no heart to God in it. Well, my point to you is, it doesn't matter what the name on the door is, you and I can walk through that door and do the same thing no matter where we are. You can walk into church, and every church has, has a, a system, an order to it. Well, I guess maybe not every church. There are some churches that are totally chaotic, okay? I'm, I, I'll just exclude them for a little while, all right? I'm saying we're going to come in, and we're going to do certain things. You know, when we say stand, and we say sit, and we sing, and we pray, and we bow our head, you can do all of that and completely disengage. You can do it kind of like you brush your teeth in the morning, you know? You've done it how many times in your life? Some of you, maybe you need to start brushing your teeth. Never mind. <laughs> but, you know, you, you, you've got routines in your life that you've done so many times. And worship can become that. And if it becomes that, it ceases to be worship. God, God prepared, planted Israel, set her apart. All that he's done, and that question just rings, what more could I do? What more could I have done for my vineyard than I've already done for her? What more? And the point was to ring out in their hearts, there's nothing more God needed to do. But what did Israel do? They turned it into worthless worship of God. They didn't cease. They didn't cease to go through the events. They didn't cease to sacrifice. They, they just made it worthless, meaningless. Well, you know, the New Testament tells us all of this has happened to Israel as an example, that we wouldn't follow their example of unbelief. We will repeat the same sin. Paul would tell us, and I'm not sure if I put the text up there or not. No, I did not. All right. So I don't think I did. Let me see. No. All right. I'll just go back and leave it there. But in uh, Romans chapter 8, when Paul makes this declaration in Romans 8, he said, of God, and he makes kind of that kind of comparison. We say, what more was there for God to do? And I, in Romans 8, Paul says, who did not spare? Speaking of God, God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also uh, with him graciously give us all things? Uh, and what more is there that God could give? There are times in all of our lives where we uh, look at our circumstances and we think God hasn't done enough. At that moment, moment in time, I've really 
I mean, I, I'm in a, a bad place spiritually when I begin to think that way. Because God gave his son. What more? What more would we ever ask? What more could you ever ask? And if God has given his son, will he not give you everything that you really need to live a life of godliness? So if there's something you think you really need to live for God and he hasn't given it to you, guess who's wrong? Not God, right? Not God. So in, Israel turned the provisions of God into something all about themselves. And the net result was their worship was worthless. We can do the same thing. We can do the very same thing. And that is what God really, one of the messages that God has rung home and should ring home, I hope, in all of our hearts as we look at that question, what more was there to do that I have not done? And then God says in response to the unbelief of his people, he removes the hedge of protection from them. He's going to remove it. And the nation's going to be trampled down. And, and, and uh, that worthlessness is going to be destroyed because what, what should have been produced was a people who genuinely loved God, God's provision for them, and the response and the obedience of faith should have brought forth a, a harvest of righteousness and justice from the nation, but it did not. And the activity of meaningless worship uh, will never transform your heart. When we, one of the things that the seriousness of worship is that we come every Sunday to enter the presence of God to hear from God. And that we need to hear from God and have God working in our hearts to transform our lives. Uh, because th if, if we're really worshiping God and growing in our love for God, then we will be growing in the, the fruit that flows from that. Right? The, flute that, the fruit that flows from genuine loving God is the fruits of genuine righteousness. You know, we tend to do, and we had this discussion in Sunday school, and it was kind of like one of those light-on things, at least in my own thinking, is... You know, we've tended for many years to, to say, okay, you know, pastor, you tell me the things that Monday through Friday I'm not supposed to do, and I'll put my checklist of my not do's, and give me my other checklist of my, my things I should do, and uh, tell me some things that will make me look and spiritual, and everybody will believe I'm really spiritual, and if I do all those things, I'm good to go. Well, the problem with all of that is you can do all of that with no heart for God. You can do all of that and make it about yourself. That's what Israel did with their worship. They created a whole system of rules, a lot of rules. Not necessarily bad ones either. Some of them were ridiculous. Some of them didn't make any sense. But they weren't, like, bad. They weren't, like, trying to go out and sin. They were trying to make rules that would, quote, but rules don't make you holy, right? And, and we can do that very thing, but the fruit of righteousness, this genuine righteousness that God looks for, is not just that you do the right things, but that you have the right heart relationship with him. That you genuinely love what God loves. And, and when then I worship the God who is righteous, and I love God who is righteous, when that love for God grows, and the worship of God grows, the fruit of that will be righteous. You know what? I don't, you know, yes, I could then objectify things that I stay away from. And say, you know what, as a, a person who loves God, I don't do these things. But the point is, it's as a person who loves God and is living in righteousness, I don't do those. Why? Because I don't want anything to do with them. It's not that I do, don't do this or I do these things in order to have a standing with God or to make people around me think I have a standing with God. There's a huge difference in the whole approach. Matter of a proper biblical perspective on how to live. And so part of our, our, de our, our desperate need uh, in worship is to remember God has made every provision for us to live a life of godliness. Every provision has provided all that we need that we would live a life that would truly honor, exalt, and glorify him. There's nothing more, nothing more that God, I mean, that God has not provided, okay? He's provided it all, and he's directed us to the means of growth. He's directed us to come, to come together uh, through the word and through worship and to come with a heart hungry to grow in a genuine love and affection for God that then produces a genuine hatred for sin. And not just a, hey, give me a set of, give me a set of things to do this week. Give me a, things, a set of things not to do this week. And if I do those, I'm good, right? No, God wants your 
what God wanted from Israel. And if Israel would have given God their heart, the fruit would have been altogether different. They didn't stop worshiping. They didn't stop going through activities. They didn't stop sacrificing. They didn't stop giving. They didn't stop any of that. But what they stopped is they turned it into a whole external worship, which God said was worthless. It's a tremendous parable with a very convicting question. So I pray that God will help us to examine the worship that we come, we offer to God on a weekly basis. Because the end of the day, the end of today, we've entered in God's presence to offer him worship. And always the fundamental question is, is God pleased with our offering? Do we come into the presence of God to offer him our lives and say, God, mold me, change me. Mold me, change me. Shape Christ in me. That I might love what you love, hate what you hate and then praise God for his provision and the absolute certainty of the future for God's people. It's not a maybe, is it? Folks, that's good news. It's not a maybe. Our future is an absolute certainty because of who our God is and what he has accomplished. And he simply wants you and me to love him truly, wholly, with a whole heart. And when I do, then I will begin loving what God loves and hating what God loves.